Um, hello everyone, good morning. Um, well, as Thomas said, uh, yeah, I, I will try to take you along a little bit um, into the realm of how urban climate comes about. But um, I, I will keep it very simple and understandable, so I'm not going to yeah, tell you a rocket science uh, story here. So, uh, yeah, I think I will just uh, start sharing my screen. Can you all see it? Yeah, yes. excellent. Uh, well, so um, I will try to uh, talk a little bit about how we have to understand urban climate because um, <clears throat> I think it's very important to understand some of the basics because um, as you also, I heard that, uh, yeah, there was a little discussion about this in re relation to Birgit's talk, but also, Yesterday, what um, Deepke Klem uh, was talking about, the clever and cool story, <clears throat> it's really about um, implementing the right things in the right spot. And this requires a kind of basic understanding. Yeah? Because um, as Deepke has, I think, also talked about, you, you can put green everywhere. You can put trees everywhere, but they can also work in the wrong direction. So it's really important to understand um, the basics of urban climate. And well, I hope that that my uh, little talk is just giving you a hunch and, and perhaps uh, nudges you to, to dive further into this, to understand a bit more about it. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, Birgit has already also touched upon the issues that occur uh, when we talk about urban heat. Um, we all know these uh, issues when the city is getting too hot. We have sleepless nights, people have health problems. Um, using open spaces is becoming quite difficult. And then also in the light that many people are already suffering in small housing conditions. So when they go outdoors, yeah, people they can hardly find the shade that they need in these uh, situations. So, yeah, it's 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 really getting more and more of an issue. But it's also important to understand that the way we experience um, the thermal environment depends on various factors, and um, it's it's important to understand that, of course. Uh, air temperature is one of the factors that of course uh, has a big influence on how we experience temperature also relative humidity but uh, what is very important outdoors of course is if we are exposed to the shortwave radiation by the sun this can also be um, basically reflected by materials in the city, for instance, when we have bright materials, you can really easily feel that when you walk over, for instance, a surface of white gravel in the sun, that this solar radiation is also hitting you, let's say, from underneath. Another thing is that um, all the solar energy that is um, actually getting into the urban system, into the pavements, into the walls, etc., that gets also partly stored and is then emitted as long wave radiation. I think a lot of you people know it. Um, when you're standing in front of a wall in the evening that has been exposed to the sun over day, it still emits a lot of this work. And this is a very, very important process to understand also the occurrence of the urban heat island. So it really matters what kind of materials we use, how much shade we provide in the city, and of course, also very important, wind. Um, we know, at least here in Northern Europe uh, or Western Europe, where we have quite a lot of exposure to stronger winds, that wind can be really a big nuisance and um, 
I have once been blown off my bike and I think some people in the Netherlands, I see Inge is nodding so they can tell about that experience too. Um, I think in Southern Europe, it's a bit less of an issue, but wind can of course also be a good thing. Ventilation is very often very necessary during summer. And this, this uh, parameter of wind is very important uh, to play with. And um, it's also important to understand that, for instance, trees, they also capture wind. So sometimes the trees that cast shade and provide evaporation, etc., they also stop the wind. And then you really have to think carefully where you put them. Um, so in a way, you know, we are like the, the, the DJs mastering the whole switchboard of um, all these, these different parameters, uh, air temperature, humidity, radiation uh, from the sun, but also this long wave radiation and the wind, by the way, how we shape our city. So let me go a little bit uh, deeper into this um, topic, let's say scale it up into the urban fabric. Um, so it's, this is, for instance, showing us how the city um, radiation budgets work. For uh, instance, here over day, we see that the solar radiation, you know, it kind of hits the urban fabric in different direction. And um, the energy is actually also absorbed by the walls of the buildings, by the pavements, etc. To some degree, it's also reflected, but a lot of this is stored depending on the materials. And of course, a little bit of this uh, radiation already gets emitted again as heat radiation. Now, when we switch off the, the sun at night, of course, we don't have this short wave radiation. And then this emitted warmth from all the uh, built environments, the, the building materials, especially stony materials that have absorbed a lot of this energy, they really start emitting this. And this is warming up the air um, bodies between buildings. Now you can imagine when we have all this radiation at night that let's say wants to escape the system, here, when we are in an open landscape, this radiation it can go everywhere. And um, when we are opposed to that kind of captured here with our radiation in the urban system, you can see that basically the radiation cannot really escape and then it gets trapped. So the, the heat energy is getting trapped in the urban fabric. Whereas in this open landscape here, this energy has already dissipated into the sky and this has been cooling down very quickly, but here the heat is just getting caught. And this is an important part that leads to this famous urban heat island and it is much more pronounced at night because of this. Um, what is really playing an important role, of course, that has been touch upon a little bit by, by Birgit already and also speakers yesterday is what kind of materials do we use in the city and of course this um, academy is about green uh, interventions in the city and for instance you can see it pretty nicely here in, in all these um, infrared pictures this is showing us the difference between the paved area and this planted area, both are exposed to the sun. And you see, it's only shady over here. And you can see that the shade is also here, of course, much cooler. But the paved area and this planted area are both in the solar radiation area. But you see a big temperature difference. Um, and of course, on a bigger scale, you can also see that in the urban fabrics, especially the road systems are normally um, very much heated up. Um, and if you compare that then to these open here, you, you see the aerial picture and here it's the same as the um, uh, infrared picture. Um, you can see, for instance, these open big 
meadows along the river, the floodplains, these are very cool areas. So, well, I think these, these uh, uh, pictures already show that the materiality of the city is very important. And of course, also the degree of greenery that um, is used at different levels. But uh, also the materials are really important uh, to understand because many building materials actually um, have different um, properties. One very important property is what is called albedo, and that is the amount of the solar radiation that is hitting this material and how much gets reflected. So, for instance, when we look at tar paper, a very dark material, it only reflects 5% of the incoming radiation, so it absorbs a lot of heat. But when we compare this, for instance, with white paint um, on a metal sheet, for instance, um, then you see that a lot of the radiation is actually um, reflected. So that means that the materials, before they actually absorb energy, they already reflect it. So they also pick up less. But when they get a lot of energy coming in at some stage, these materials, they of course also store this energy. And there we see that many of the different building materials are actually um, absorbing a lot of um, the heat. It's, but some differences um, are, um, really exist when we talk about um, metals. They, they don't emit a lot and, and don't absorb a lot. So, and also, uh, but I don't have the absorption uh, coefficients here, but also wooden um, surfaces, because wood has a lot of air in it, um, it also absorbs less heat and it emits less. So, because it's just lighter, it has less mass. So, um, yeah, it's really important to understand a little bit about the different materials in the city and um, their properties when it comes to reflecting the energy and also absorbing and then emitting it again into the urban fabric. And what is also important is to understand that um, we as humans, since let's say mainly the industrial revolution, we have also altered the um, thermal system of the city due to combustion processes. So for instance, by industry that emits a lot of heat and very, very important, of course, um, all kind of sorts of traffic. Also our heating and cooling our buildings has an influence. And um, yeah, I appreciate that, that Birgit already raised this issue. Putting um, air conditioners, for instance, to try to cool the buildings is really starting up a vicious circle because when everyone starts to put air conditioners in the summer to cool the city, uh, to, to cool the indoors, actually they warm the city outside with 10%. So what are we doing? This is really a no-go. So um, air conditioners are really um, making the situation worse. Uh, but also traffic is really a big uh, cause of, of this uh, so-called anthropogenic heat. And we can see, for instance, in this um, simulation for different times of the day in Seoul, in South Korea, that uh, during the rush hours, this um, amount of anthropogenic heat production due to traffic is much higher than outside the traffic um, peaks. So yeah, car traffic is also a problem, especially when we're talking about cities in these very um, dense and deep urban canyons. Well, and then we get to our favorite topic, green in the city. Um, I think it has been addressed by different people already, but I, I of course, want to um, emphasize it again. Um, green interventions in the city have uh, various good effects. 
Um, if we compare, for instance, this green lawn area with this road area, it is cooler. Um, although both are exposed to the sun, this is cooler because the lawn is at the same time um, uh, uh, allowing capillary movement of water from deeper soil layers into the air body and um, then it starts to evaporate. This evaporation is always causing a tempering of the air temperature because when water evaporates, it um, absorbs energy from the system, so the air is getting cooler. Now, when we have a big tree, of course, we have a big surface of leaves, and the leaves have small stomata, small openings with which they, let's say, breathe. And these openings, they also evaporate water, especially during the day. And this evapotranspiration, it is called, is of course also cooling down the air temperature. And because the leaves of the tree have much, much more surface than, for instance, the underlying lawn, we have a big surface that can help to cool the air. And then, of course, uh, they also cast shadows. So they make sure that the leaves underneath, the top leaves, and also the soil underneath, the, co uh, the crown of the tree is cooler. This is leading in total to a significant increase of the air temperature in these park areas. So these were here kind of bike um, measurement transects in, in a Canadian city. And you can see that the air temperature is clearly dropping here in this little park and it is rising again over here. Another thing that we see is what, what is quite interesting is that uh, knowing that the, the wind uh, direction is here coming from the west, uh, we see that the air temperature behind this green area is rising a little bit more slowly. And this has to do with the fact that the wind is transporting the cool air, uh, wind, uh, sorry, the cool air masses into this urban fabric, let's say behind this park. So when we design these fringes of a park in a smart way, we can allow these cooler air fluxes also into the built up areas. Anyway, to give a, a, a kind of overview of what is happening in, in the urban fabric um, when it comes to the typical um, types of, of urban environments, we see that um, environments that are very densely built up like these downtown areas, um, they have a very significant night urban heat island effect. You will see the night temperatures in blue, day temperatures in red. And um, I will also talk about something else in a minute. Um, and we see that, for instance, Parks have a lower temperature um, than these highly built up areas. And of course, in the rural open areas, this is much less. <clears throat> uh, what is interesting to see is that um, over day, we, we can very clearly discern a big difference between the so-called surface temperature and the air temperature. Um, and this surface temperature is something that uh, Birgit also showed in the effects of the, uh, for instance, of the trees. When uh, also you did this quiz, the 10 to 12 um, degrees of lowering the temperature is not the air temperature. It is the surface temperature. Uh, so it's the temperature that has been measured on the leaves of the tree. So we must not think that when we plant a tree, that the air temperature underneath is becoming 10 to 12 degrees less. Surface temperature is always like what you would feel when you touch that exact surface. So you have to climb to the top to the tree to feel how hot the, the leaves are there, as it were. But the air temperature, when you just put your, your uh, thermometer in the air, this is what you see here, and that is much more constant 
and it doesn't change in very small portions of the city. So that is important to understand. And another interesting thing in this overview, I think, is what we see happening here. Um, we see that around a water body, the temperature over day, it can be much cooler because when it's quite a big pond, we also get ventilation here, and this can cool the air temperature. But at night, because water is warming up very slowly and cooling down very slowly, we see a heat peak. So um, we must not expect our urban water bodies to help us combating urban heat. So this, this is always a big misunderstanding and I like to make sure that people know, well, when we make all these water bodies in the city, well, they're nice to capture extra rainwater, etc., but they won't really help us to, to cool down the city a lot. Um, and that now we know that we have these big uh, differences of temperature between these densely built up areas and the more open areas. I think it's also important to understand that when we build dense areas, we really get this uh, warming up effect and the warm, heat, uh, the warm air is actually much lighter than cold air. So you get what is called the chimney effect. The warm air is rising up. So when we have a densely built up area, we get quite big warm air masses and they rise up and they call it a kind of suction in the air. So the, the air that is going out here, of course, it tries to drag in new air from elsewhere. And this effect is much smaller when we have a loosely built up area, like you know, residential areas with more gardens, etc. And when we then create next to these densely built up areas that heat up very strongly, very open green areas that cool down very quickly, then we get a nice ventilation effect here because. There's a big difference between this hot area, let's say, and a very cool area at night, and then the air is dragged into, and then we get a nice ventilation between these types of um, land use. When we have these loosely built up areas that don't warm up so much, and we have a park, for instance, that is also at night not cooling down as much as these big green open areas, then we have much less of these ventilation effects. So um, yeah, we can really play with, with um, these different interventions in many ways. <clears throat> and I just want to round off with a couple of uh, yeah, suggestions how we can intervene in the urban system with different green interventions. And I have also given some indications of the effects. So um, the good thing about uh, green interventions is always that we <coughs> both can do something about the radiation budget, but we also have this evapotranspiration effect from the leaves. So for instance, if you want to create shade, perhaps, and normally we need, excuse me, <coughs> Normally we need shade in summer and um, luckily leaves are growing in summer and they uh, retract during winter when we have uh, the need for more solar radiation. So if you have a park or a garden, it's actually smart to use this natural process of creating shade in summer. And of course, we get the extra cooling via the plant stomata. Uh, if you have a small garden and, and can't, can't plant a tree, but you really want to have shadow, maybe you can use plants with very big leaves. And these leaves are just uh, de dead in winter. So then we have a sunny place here. Um, if we want to uh, lower the, the air temperature in the urban fabric, but also indoors, and uh, Birgit has also addressed it a little bit already, 
um, we should really seriously take into account the possibilities of green facade systems. Um, they have a huge effect on cooling the indoors and also absorbing the heat that could be emitted to the outdoors. And well, I have uh, the numbers here. I think you, you can you also get the presentations afterwards. So or there's a recording, so you can take a look at this again. Um, so green facades really have a very, very big effect. Um, of course, um, street trees are very useful when we want to cast uh, shade on the street, on the houses. Only when we have streets with a lot of traffic, then we also capture air pollution underneath. And then we have to be a little bit more careful with how we plant the trees. Um, and of course, depaving in any uh, way is always a good idea wherever possible. So also in infrastructure, tram lines, or perhaps also in roads that are not used a lot. Why do we have to pave the whole space between buildings when it's only a few tracks that are, are needed, for instance, for, for the car tires? So uh, let's really think about wherever possible to depave the city and green it. This is, you know, these kind of interventions are always good they don't uh, hamper air fluxes etc um, they are not uh, like trees that can sometimes hamper this or when we use bushes shrubbery hedges all these vertical green elements they have to be placed in a very smart way but depaving can be done everywhere that is uh, an intervention that is basically a no regret measure and it works for many things of course also when we want to capture more rainwater. So these are just a few um, suggestions what can be done to uh, use green interventions in the city and well it's it's not uh, really something new. Uh, I just wanted to provide you also with uh, some numbers about how uh, these things work and well if you are interested in um, more information, I have also written a book. Many of the pictures in my talk are from my book. Um, so perhaps if you are interested in, in uh, getting more information how to design with um, urban climate, take a look. Um, with this, I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>